All right, I think we'll get started. Um, welcome to the Hopkins Business Health Initiative webinar series. I'm Dan Polsky, Director of the Hopkins Business of Health Initiative, or HBHI. This initiative brings together scholars from across the university who share a mission to advance health through an affordable and equitable high-value health system. HBHI focuses on the role of business and incentives in advancing this vision. I'm delighted to welcome you to the next installment of the Conversations on the Business of Health webinar series. Today is all about the business of digital behavioral health. First, a thank you to our co-sponsor, the Center for Mental Health and Addiction Policy. The center provides a solutions-oriented institutional home for the diverse research and educational efforts at the Bloomberg School in the areas of mental health and addiction policy. So I'm now gonna turn the proceedings over to our moderators and creators of this exciting panel. First, uh, Matt Eisenberg, an associate professor at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and a member of the HBHI leadership team. Also Beth McGinty, chief of the Division of Health Policy and Economics and the Livingston Ferran Professor of Public Health at Weill Cornell Medicine, former member of HBHI's leadership team, um, but we're proud of her and her transition from Hopkins to Cornell, and it's great to have you back. So over to you both. Thanks so much, Dan. And Beth, we'll still consider you leadership team emeritus uh, for, for HBHI. Um, so welcome, everybody, to this uh, exciting event, uh, co-sponsored between HBHI and the Center for Mental Health and Addiction Policy, as Dan uh, mentioned. I'm Matt Eisenberg and thrilled to, to have you here. Before we introduce our panelists, I thought we'd do just a very little bit of stage setting. And the first is the term behavioral health. So that term can have a variety of different meeting, meanings. In our case today, by behavioral health, we mean mental health and substance use um, uh, care. So if we think recently, there's been a lot of telehealth policy changes, this rapid mobile technology developments, and a lot of consumer demand for virtual behavioral health services. And that's led to kind of this explosion of digital uh, behavioral health services, including virtual service delivery platforms and health applications, and these can even include FDA approved digital therapeutics, so really a wide range of uh, services. These services are totally reshaping the behavioral health landscape um, in the US. Venture capital backed digital platforms like Spring Health, who we have the CEO with us um, today, now deliver therapy as well as medication prescribing. So it's really a whole new world for behavioral health. So our goal today is really to bring together academic business and industry leaders to discuss the evolution of this industry, its efficacy, and what's in store for the future. So with that, I'll turn it over to Beth, who will introduce uh, herself and our panelists. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Dan already did all the introduction of me that is needed, so I'm going to focus on our incredible panelists who have joined us today beginning with Steve Blumenfield, who is the Head of Partnerships and Alliances for Willis Towers Watson, or WTW, and the leader of WTW's efforts to curate the digital mental health solution marketplace for the last five years. He is also the host of the Cure for the Common Co podcast, so you may know him there, which is a podcast on healthcare innovation. And he is a published author in this space, space of digital mental health. Steve has previously served in the health plan and pharmacy benefit manager leadership roles, and he's a trained facilitator for the National Alliance for Mental Illness. So welcome, Steve. Our next panelist is Adam Checkroud. And Adam co-founded Spring Health, a behavioral health startup. Spring Health is a comprehensive mental health benefit for employers. They help employees understand their mental health issues and connect with best-in-class providers to get the right treatment at the right time. As an academic, uh, in a, Adam has an academic background in addition to his uh, startup expertise. Adam developed computational approaches to improve the treatment of mental illness, largely through better matching of specific symptom profiles with specific medications, treatments, or exercise regimens. So you can see how his worlds merge there. 
And then our third panelist is Dr. Lisa Marsh, who is the founding director of the Dartmouth Center for Technology and Behavioral Health, a designated center of excellence supported by the National Institute on Drug Abuse, NIDA, at the National Institutes of Health. The Dartmouth Center for Technology and Behavioral Health is a national interdisciplinary center and includes um, affiliates um, at Dartmouth with the Geisel School of Medicine, the College of Arts and Sciences, the Thayer School of Engineering, and the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice. So a really interdisciplinary perspective on digital behavioral health. And the center also includes interdisciplinary partners across the US and internationally, as uh, including several of us on this webinar. So huge welcome to our panelists. And we are just going to jump in to discussion. Uh, folks in attendance, please go ahead and submit questions as we go here, and we will work them into conversation to the best of our ability. We'll also try to save some time at the end of the conversation uh, to take questions from the audience. So for our first question that I'd love to have each of our panelists kick off with a response to, Let's talk about where this digital behavioral health industry has come from and how it has evolved over the past five to 10 years. Let's start with Steve on this one. Welcome. Sure. Thanks, Emma. Uh, and thanks, Matt and uh, everybody. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. It's been a fascinating ride to watch the evolution of this space over the past decade. Really just amazing. You know, we at WTW, we're working with large and mid-sized employers to put in their benefit plans largely. And we're assessing new vendors and new technologies. And that's that was my role for many, many years. And in the digital health space, it was pretty fascinating to see how um, employers tended to have this thing that folks might understand called an EAP program or an employee assistance program, which would be a resource to try to get some mental health support and then maybe refer you to someone in network but there were always challenges with that kind of solution. Typically, it was because there wasn't good reimbursement. I think people on this call, many, many may be aware of this. Adam is shaking his head because certainly his solution uh, addresses this right, right as a core problem. Um, but you know, challenges with who's in network, how updated those um, uh, the directories are, uh, the, how well they match to actual experience capability, and of course, the wait to actually get some care were all some big issues. And we started to see, if anyone can remember what it was like before COVID times, we started to see a bunch of digital solutions come up at first. And these were solutions that were self-service, um, many of them against uh, stress and resilience endpoints, some of them trying to be more robust than that, um, and certainly some good ones. And we saw, of course, um, folks might not even recall this as often, but the big telemedicine companies then put in place behavioral health networks, but they had the look and feel of a telemedicine solution. Uh, then we had some navigators pop up. We saw essentially a bunch of different point solutions that we call them at different points along the continuum until smart companies like Spring Health figured out we could stack this end to end and solve the problem because the problem isn't someone wants an app. The problem is someone wants to get care and they don't care if it's done um, here or there, they're not hung up on the location as much. They want to get good care with the right people. And the best kind of care is to do what makes sense to us naturally, to be able to get to a provider quickly, have some tools that might be um, digital or virtual supported, um, and then to be able to expand that to cover all types of different care. So we've seen this industry mature dramatically from really a bunch of small point, you know, point solution type of spaces that began to get woven together then suddenly to kind of mature, if you will, into, into this solution space with companies like Spring that are actually now competing with the EAPs and helping to lift their games to offer what we call end-to-end -end solutions. So uh, that's been that's been my observation. Curious how others see things. Thank you for kicking us off. Lisa? 
Yeah, thanks so much, Beth and Matthew, for inviting me to this really um, important and exciting discussion today. So yeah, I've been uh, working in this space for a long time, for many decades actually working in the space of digital behavioral health. And as you heard from Beth's introduction, our work has heavily focused on bringing science to the space and how do we optimally develop and evaluate and implement digital health solutions and really create scalable solutions. And you know, having worked in this space for a long time, to me, this feels like a really, uh, exciting moment in time. I think there's a whole confluence of factors that are really transforming the digital behavioral health industry and really positioning it to really explode and really drive impact globally. I think there are many things that drive that. First, as we know, we've seen heavily accelerated by the pandemic, a, a, a big demand, a growth in demand for remote models of care, uh, not just telehealth solutions, but also digital therapeutics, you know, software that are that can be clinical grade interventions delivered on a digital delivery platform. We, at the same time, unfortunately, have seen a, a big growing need in the behavioral health needs of our population, um, considerable spike in mental health challenges that people all over the world have been experiencing. Uh, I've been excited to see the growth in the digital health industry. Again, really in the last couple of years, the market um, growth in investment in this space, not only in venture uh, sort of capital investment, but you know, global pharmaceutical companies building out digital health formularies. Um, and again, not just in our country, but all over the world, we've seen some really exciting growth in this space. At the same time, we're seeing multiple paths to deployment of digital health tools. So you heard Matthew mention there's an FDA regulatory pathway where you can get prescribable software, but we have all kinds of other pathways, including pharmacy benefit managers, employers, uh, and we even have national coverage in several countries. And although reimbursement, I, I know we're going to talk about that today. We've already heard a bit about that from Steve, but you know, although reimbursement still needs to be worked out in many scenarios, we're seeing a lot of evolution in the payment landscape as well, um, including not just sort of private payers and employers embracing these types of approaches, but also, you know, we even have some pending legislation in Congress now to increase um, CMS coverage for some digital therapeutics and really sort of having different reimbursement codes matched to value. So I think this whole confluence of factors really positions us well to really scale and have a, a big population level impact with digital health solutions. Thank you, Lisa. Adam, tell us your perspectives on the evolution of the industry. Yeah, I totally agree with everything that's been said. Um, I, I, I would totally echo Steve's conceptualization as well. I would say that if you go back even five years, uh, the, the incumbent solutions like an employee assistance program or a health plan, there were a lot of complaints around access, right? Uh, whether it's framed as low engagement and people were not enrolling in these services or whether it's framed in terms of time to access, right? You would call a 1-800 number, they bounce you around, they give you some providers, you call those providers, they tell you they're not seeing new patients, you know, you keep calling around, eventually someone takes you and then they tell you it's a five-week wait, you know, which for people who have been... Um, you know, they've often sat on these problems for a while and, and then they eventually pluck up the courage and then they're told, you know, five weeks away, it's a, a bit of a kick in the teeth. Um, and, and totally agree that most of the innovation that happened in the past five years even uh, was really focused around access, right? You saw a lot of these solutions, whether it was industry sponsored or whether they were publicly available, people really digitizing the registries and, and um, solving that front end problem of access around putting a provider online. Sometimes you can even schedule with them and, and that really helps with some of the access problems that existed. Um, but flying under the radar in that was this quality issue, right? And and access was drawing so much attention that we weren't even talking about quality. The, the providers that people were seeing in the in the EAP that you know they're not mandated mandated to use an electronic health record. They're certainly not tracking the progress or tracking any outcomes that these providers are, are delivering. And so, um, I think over over recent times, this, these issues of quality, whether it's things like access to evidence based treatments or or providers using um, tools and techniques techniques that are that are approved and known to work that's one piece of it the second piece is clearly around trial and error that goes on in care we know that about 70 percent of people don't recover with whatever treatment they're given first time around and so lots and lots of people are spinning the wheels in treatment um which is which is both miserable for the patient that's going through it and also extremely ineffective um, when we think about the population health aspect of behavioral health trying to you know optimize the system so that we can generate more capacity from the resources that we have and so um yeah, to totally agree with with that. And I think that over the coming years, I think there'll be even more focus on on quality now that some of these access issues have become table stakes. I think we'll see um, 
we'll see a lot more progress on quality. That's great. Thank, thanks, Adam. I'm, I'm hoping to move on to our second topic, and I see uh, our first question in the chat, so I want to weave that in and uh, encourage others that uh, they can throw questions in the chat uh, at, as we go. Uh, Adam, you gave us a nice segue there talking about quality. One of the other issues that comes up is the efficacy um, uh, of the digital treatments themselves versus more traditional um, in-person methods, so or non-digital standard evidence-based or lack of evidence-based treatments. Um, so I'm hoping y'all can comment on the efficacy of digital-based treatments. And to weave in our question from the audience, there was a question about the role of digital behavioral health tools with the problem of children and adolescents uh, who have serious behavioral disorders. Um, uh, so can you talk if there's any difference in the efficacy or if it's been studied in the adult or the children adolescent population as well and how these tools could help children and adolescents? Um, Lisa, let's start with you on this one. I have to unmute here. Okay, great, thanks for the question. Um, well, we work across the whole digital health spectrum, but heavily in the space of digital therapeutics. So I'll start with that. So again, digital therapeutics are literally taking medical grade interventions and embedding the active therapeutic ingredients of those into the functionality and content of software and de delivering it through software. And we've been studying this for a long time. And what we've seen is that um, not only can you, well, first of all, you can ensure the fidelity and delivery of, of the intervention through that digital delivery platform, but we've seen that not only can we get outcomes that are as good as clinician delivered care, a lot of times we can get outcomes that are better than clinician delivered care on all kinds of behavioral health conditions and addiction treatment and depression, anxiety, bipolar, more serious psych psychiatric illnesses on and on. It's a, it, in medical regimen adherence, on and on. It really is, is generalizable across the spectrum if you develop these well and really can create engaging tools. And what I think is important there, it, this is not about replacing clinicians for folks who may not know the behavioral health space. We do have effective treatments, but most people struggling with mental health, most people struggling with substance use disorders do not engage in our traditional systems of care. Sometimes it's access issues, often it's stigma issues. There are lots of factors contributing to that that, but maybe we, we have 80% or so in some communities of that population struggling with these conditions, not seeking care. And so this is one, one really key benefit, I think, of these digital tools is allowing us to enhance the reach and the scalability and widespread access to therapeutic tools that can really impact people's lives and their functioning and their outcomes. And so I've been really excited by the robust effects that we can see in this space. I mean, these are, you know, we can, we can, you know, you know, double you know, sort of abstinence rates when we have these tools as part of treatment versus not. We can have you know, long-term durable potent effects on depression management and other behavioral health conditions, chronic pain management, et cetera. The clinical effects are actually quite striking and have been documented now for decades, literally. And so it's really an opportunity to think about, you know, we have this strong empirical support for the utility of these tools. How do we actually get them out there? How do we have make these available, low barrier access to people to use in their daily lives? That's great, Lisa. Do you have any thoughts on this children versus adults? Is that, have you seen these effects in kind of all aspects uh, uh, of the life course? Yeah, I think the, the well in the research world and clinical applications, we've certainly seen um, tools developed for the whole translational spectrum, from from children to you know aging populations and and lots of populations in between, and you know how you develop and engage your target audience and what you embed in the tools that really have value and relevance to the experience of the target audience is really key. But absolutely, there and there are there are uh, effective resources for kids, including there's at least one FDA authorized prescription digital therapeutic for kids targeting ADHD. Thank you so much. Uh, Adam, do you have thoughts on this efficacy uh, uh, issue? Yeah, there's a lot to unpack. <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't say, look, in some ways it's not an evidence issue and in some ways it is, right? And it is an evidence issue in that most mental health apps are not validated, right? And there's, there's a lot's been said in the literature that people are just putting out apps. It's very easy to develop an app. It's very easy to call it something like mental health, even if you don't use the word mental health. Um, and those things are kind of um, the wild, wild west. If you go in, into, the, into the app store, there's lots and lots of solutions that are not proven to work. 
And then on the other side, mental health doesn't have an evidence problem, right? If you look at the effectiveness of most treatments that we have, gold standard things like SSRIs, things like evidence-based treatments, uh, in, it, when you put it in terms of something like a number needed to treat, they are effective. They're very effective compared to, you know, drugs that we have in um, in uh, in other areas of medicine, like cardiovascular medicine in, in particular, right? And so I don't think that it's an efficacy problem. I think that there's certainly a, a treatment matching problem that is more obvious in behavioral health care than that is in other areas of medicine, right? Um, what what it is about medication that causes side effects or what it is about a therapy that causes poor, you know, fit either with that therapeutic technique or with that therapeutic, that therapist in particular, you know, that matching problem is, is clearly uh, most painful in mental health compared to other areas, right? Because we know on a group level, these treatments are effective, but they're only working in, in trials, maybe 30 or 40% of the time, but 70 to 80% of people do recover eventually, right? It's just that they are iterating through multiple treatments to figure that out. And so, so, um, so yeah, I would say that in some ways it's an efficacy problem. In some ways it's not an efficacy problem. I would say that maybe the biggest issue that we have is really around incentives, right? When you look in um, in behavioral health in general, I think treatment is not valued appropriately, right? I think that payers, willingness to pay is relatively low. And I think that just because of the way that mental health, the consequences of most mental health conditions um, are largely related to productivity or absenteeism or, or kind of workplace related, um, disability related or workplace related uh, costs. I think that compared to other medical issues, I think patients are a little bit reluctant to pay. I think that the costs of most mental health care is sometimes expensive. Take aside the you know generic antidepressants. I think therapy in general is pretty expensive, if, especially if you're in a major metro area and you have to pay out of pocket. Um, and, and so you have to look to what are the funding mechanisms that are available to pay for that care. I think employers have certainly stepped up, right? And you've seen in recent years, this is not just a a, a premium benefit for the high cost workforces. You see companies like Whole Foods, like PepsiCo, like General Mills, like JB Hunt, you know, big, large American employers of frontline workforces that are, that are really investing in mental health because they see and they can appreciate the ROI. Um, but then when you look at major payers, you don't see that investment. When you look at uh, government funding, you also don't see that investment. And then when you look at the cost, I mean, I think that the cost is perhaps too high for, for individual um, and just to bear for, for a lot of mental health services. All of those things are exacerbated in the child space, right? The, the, the volume of evidence is, is, you know, much lower. The quality of the evidence is much lower and the access issues are even more exacerbated. So if you're, you know, you're looking for a facility for, a, you know, your daughter has an eating disorder or, you, you know, your child has autism, those things are incredibly frustrating, incredibly frustrating for people to try and figure out. Thanks so much, Adam. Uh, Steve. Yeah, I've been uh, just dying to jump in. Boy, Adam, you <laughs> opened up so many cans of worms. I would love to just put uh, to hit so many of those. They're awesome. They're all right. And thank you, Lisa, for your your comments. Uh, let me just start reversed uh, on the on the child side. It's been wonderful to see that there are a number of solutions that have uh, surfaced to directly targeting uh, either in network or directly as carve outs. Uh, teen and child mental health care. So it's just awesome to see that. And then, then companies like Spring and others actually serving those populations increasingly. So that's that's just great news. So we hope hope to, to address the issue earlier on um, of how we can get that care to those people. And by the way, connect that back to local care as needed. We haven't talked about how um, one of the great side effects of this revolution in digital health care and virtual health care is that it's teaching traditional companies like EAPs and health plans and like health systems to be a, be a bit more progressive and actually treat people um, where they want to be treated. So, you know, the, my, the co-author of the article um, that we did in H HBR, a colleague, uh, Dr. Jeff Levenscher, sent me some data today telling me that um, for one Massachusetts health system, 70% of their um, of their behavioral health support is done um, electronically, you know, digital or virtual today, which would, would be unheard of prior to epidemic days. So, and that's also been fostered by the fact that these kinds of tools and technology ex exist. But back to the efficacy thing, I think absolutely I agree. There is not an efficacy issue, except in everybody's mind. Like we all think, oh, it can't be as good. And I love having this debate with, uh, with um, you know, again, that same guy <laughs> I mentioned a moment ago, who'll say, well, is it as good? I don't think it's as good as as you know therapy in office. And I'll say, okay, well, how good is therapy in office? Well, we don't have the data, and it can be improved. Oh, okay, so we do have the data here electronically. We absolutely have the data for what the virtual care and digital care. So until we can show that 
that it's um, not until you want you can prove that, that it's better to be in person, then we shouldn't be assuming that it's not. But there have been studies that do prove it's well it as well. So uh, there was a 2020 Veterans Administration study that showed that telepsychiatry by video was as effective as in office based care in treating depression and post traumatic stress disorder. Digital CBT programs have been proven as effective as in-person um, CBT. Uh, and then there's uh, one particular uh, app solution out there, the Resilience Solution, that showed a positive dose response effect on stress and related symptoms and enrollees. And of course, Lisa mentioned, um, yes, there is FDA approved solution for uh, for uh, ADHD in kids. There's lots of, there's plenty of evidence out there, but I think some of us are still stuck in the mindset of, is it as good? It's very clear though, if you're a user and you've had the experience, it's been a positive experience. So I think efficacy is something we can check off, but there's just, it's less proof that's needed and more experience of people in the, in the, in the paradigm. Great, fascinating conversation on the efficacy point. Thanks to those of you who have put some questions in the list, uh, just uh, flagging that we see them and we'll do our best to work them in in the coming minutes as we move forward here. So we just focused that bit of conversation on efficacy. In the health policy world, in addition to efficacy, we are very interested in understanding spending and costs writ large. So let's spend the next few minutes hearing from the panelists about how we should think about price and costs in the context of digital behavioral health treatments writ large. And you know, reflections on is the move towards digital behavioral health a way to curb cost growth, or could this move potentially lead to even more spending in this space? Adam, let's start with you on this one. Tricky one. Um, I, I would say, uh, I'll say that there's two principles. One is that um, we shouldn't talk about unit costs. I think that unit cost is not the right the right framing. I think we have to take the whole treatment journey into account. And so th that's one of the things that I, I will say. And then the second thing I will say is that it's on us to prove the value of the services that we're, that we're delivering, right? Um, and so on the first one, I would say, if you look at the way that we deliver mental health care today, to the extent that it is ineffective, to the, to the extent that we delay, uh, you know, that, that we do relatively little for people who are, who are in a good spot, that people who, who do have symptoms delay care for, for a long time, that when they get into care, would, you know, it takes a long time for them to recover, you know, in, in treatment as usual study, something like a clinical trial it takes 20 weeks for people to recover. And, and if it takes something like 20, 30 sessions on average for a patient to reach remission, um, then, then essentially we have to think about like, what is, what could we do better to optimize the system, right? If we could, if we could shorten the duration of care, right? Either through better treatment matching or through things like digital, um, you know, adjunctives, then I think that all of that will, will have a great impact on both reducing the total cost of the journey because fewer sessions or fewer face-to-face -face sessions are needed and Secondly, it will free up a lot more capacity and, and that that increase in supply can also help uh, balance against some of the demand that's going on for mental health services. So I would say that that's the first thing. The second thing is that it's really on us to, to prove the value of services. I think that, you know, we're clearly in a bad spot, right? If you look at the reimbursement rates that go on in commercial insurance, uh, you know, it's it's honestly, it's not great, right? It's, it's certainly not enough to meet the, the expectations that consumers have and to meet the demands that employers have. Um, on their behalf. Uh, and if you look at things like employee assistance programs, or you look at things like CMS rate cards, that's, that's even worse. We're, we're really long, far away. Like those, those rates are non-starter in many, many areas, not just New York, and California. I'm talking Texas, I'm talking Georgia, I'm talking, you know, Washington State. In, in all of those areas, those rate cards are a complete non-starter for most of the um, mental health professionals who are actually in that market. And so it's it's really on us to put together a strong ROI case to to help the purchases of those care, uh, of, of that care, understand why it's worth paying for, right? And and that's just a math question. And it's the same math question that other areas of medicine also have to answer, right? And so it, it's on us to show what is the impact that we can have on an individual patient level in terms of productivity, in terms of absenteeism, in terms of short-term disability, in terms of long-term disability, in terms of reducing ER use, in terms of, uh, you know, reducing uh, overall total total healthcare costs. And, and for as long as, um, 
for as long as the argument is that it's the right thing to do, I, I don't think that the, the the U.S. healthcare system is set up in a way that is going to increase rates, right? But for for the um, you know for the future and, and to the extent that people are willing to invest in that conversation, if we can show higher ROI, it's not just about cost; it's always a cost value trade off. And so, if you can show higher value of those services, then then the cost people will be willing to to pay more to get those. I think um, there was a question in the chat. Um, around homeless, that's a, a great example, right? If those people wanted to get access to services, what is the easiest way for them to get services? Let's go to the EL, without a doubt. You know, what are you gonna do? You're gonna call a 1-800 number? You're gonna call a 1-800 number? No, you're gonna go and try and find a, a provider uh, that, that, accepts, that accepts CMS rates. Again, strong uphill battle. And, and it's not about access to resources, right? Certainly speaking, you know, in populations that I've seen in New York who are on Medicare or Medicaid, uh, including homeless people, many of them have smartphones. It's not a it's not a device penetration issue that is stopping these people from being able to get access to services, right? But it, but if I go, you know, if I if I'm homeless and I open up my smartphone and I go and try and get access to a provider that accepts Medicare, it's going to take me a really long time. And if I walk down to the ER, Medicare is probably willing to reimburse that, but they're not willing to re reimburse you know 120 a session instead of 65 dollars a session. And so instead they end up reimbursing five or six hundred dollars for, for an ER visit that could have been accomplished in, in many cases in, uh, with an outpatient visit if they were just willing to pay slightly more on in the outpatient care. Thanks well, I'd, love, I'd love to chime in. Uh, this, yeah, this, is, this, this, is, uh, this is complicated as you started with <laughs> Adam and we haven't even scratched the surface of it. Um, we generally tell our employers not to expect savings. And they still, this is still the, the hottest, most important benefit they put in place for their people, like hard stop, because the need is so vast. The access to care need is vast. But the good news is that there is a trajectory potentially to bring some costs down here. Um, th there's, in therapy, you have this 50 minute hour you're paying for. Well, when you can break that into components because you're delivering care across uh, across um, a condition that you're managing or, or period that you're treating, the average cost of care can go down with multiple modalities, hopefully over time. I don't. I think we're still a little immature in terms of you know how we think about that spending. Um, but you know this is an underserved area. The reason that the rates are so low is because we hammered against those rates for a long time, and as a result, terrible, terrible outcomes and a, and a mental health crisis on almost any measure you can imagine. So you know. Certainly, some clients uh, of ours can't afford to put in, in, in place a more robust solution. They might, they might default for a more of a point solution for a specific area because that's what they can do and they want to provide more help and then rely on the network. And that's okay. But ultimately, you're trying to solve for a, a big health problem. And the fact that we, we're starting from a low base is, is, is really a sad state of affairs. If someone, someone has a, a heart attack, um, they're going to go to the ER, they're going to get served, whatever is needed is going to be done, right? Well, we'll try to give them the, the appropriate care management, get the right solutions in front of them, but you have to treat that. When someone has a condition, you have to treat it. The difference here is this is a longitudinal treatment in many cases. It takes a long period of time and you're, and you're, we're putting in place carve out solutions that are at a higher price. We have to address the reimbursement issue. We have to, you know, people who are, who are making this choice to serve people mental health uh, need to get paid a, a good wage and a living wage in, in some cases, because those rates that go back um, and be willing to serve people or they're going to go out of network and it's going to be harder and harder. So the uh, it is a conundrum. Uh, we're hopeful when we see employers sign up anyway, but uh, agree, it's, it's still a conundrum. Adam, you want to jump in before we open it to Lisa? I do. Yeah. Just to, just to briefly chime in. So totally agree that this, we're in this position because of this relentless focus on cost, right? We're still obsessed about that fee for service rate card on unit cost. And that is the reason why we pay nothing. We get extra, extraordinarily low utilization. Most of the incumbent vendors are, are obsessed with utilization management and getting it as low as possible because they've been paid as little as possible to deliver as few services as possible. And then, you know, they're outsourcing it to providers that will accept the lowest possible rates. And so we've ended up in this extremely low cost, extremely low value scenario. And that's why it's not just about cost, right? Spring Health is an extremely expensive solution. There's no way around it. They probably will 10x their spend that they used to have with their incumbent EAP. And yet, when we look across, you know, our book of business, maybe about six million people in the employer and the employer sponsored context alone, employers save a minimum of twelve percent net of program 
costs. So they can save money. They will spend a lot more money, probably 10 times what they used to spend on, on an EAP that had one or 2% utilization. But in this context, many, many more people will use it. And we've seen repeatedly across customers that they'll save 12% on total medical costs, net of the program costs. So if we keep on having this conversation that's just about cost and not about outcomes and not about value, we'll, we'll continue to be in the same position where you know, there'll be an EAP that has 100,000 providers in the registry. Most of the information is outdated. Even if you call them, they won't take you on as a new patient, Not certainly not within a month, probably not within two months. You know, the rates will be extremely low. The utilization will be extremely low and the employer will see no benefit. And, and ultimately, I think that's why most of the innovation has happened in the employer context, because they're paying the price. They're paying the price in terms of low productivity, in terms of people, uh, in terms of employee retention, in terms of short term disability, uh, you know, duration. And I think that that's why we've seen most of the innovation in mental health happen in the employer sponsored context. And, and there's still open questions about why payers should invest, except to please their employer customers, right? And if you look, when you look, look often in the um, in that fully insured book, outside of the employer sponsored context, you actually see that progress is pretty slow in in those um, in those in, in, uh, health plan sponsored um, uh, populations. Lisa. Thanks. Yeah, it's such an important discussion. So I have a few different thoughts about this. So first, I just wanted to very quickly pick up on something Adam commented on earlier about sort of duration of care with digital health solutions. One thing we've been seeing recently in some research that may be of note here is that, you know, because of the nature in which you can access digital health solutions, you know, 24-7 you know, accessible, like a clinician in your pocket. I mean, you can have telehealth more frequently, you can have software available to you in a way that can be readily accessible. We've been seeing that sometimes the pace at, of change, the pace of clinical impact with a digital intervention is actually shorter than um, with some of our traditional models of care where you see a clinician in a sort of intermittent episodic way. And I just mentioned it here because I think that that also has implications for cost and, and value. So just a quick comment on that to follow up on Adam's point. But um, in, terms of, in terms of value, I think, yes, cost is an issue, but I think one really key factor I think we need to consider, and we've surely seen that people, you know, sort of investing in this space value some in some communities recognize the importance of this, the value and the capacity of reach afforded by digital health. That's huge, right? Because we have a, we have an insufficient workforce to meet the population level behavioral health needs. We know that we don't have enough clinicians globally to meet this, you know, striking sort of behavioral health challenge we have at a population level. And I think that when we think about this topic, I think we also need to think about about the reach potential we have in an, in an unprecedented way with some of these tools. Um, and then another sort of, in our experience, again, in the digital therapeutic space, one, one thing that I've seen that payers have been really intrigued with, particularly in the last year or so, is, you know, going, of course, beyond the clinical trials. And then when we have, let's say, FDA authorized prescription digital therapeutics in the marketplace, really wanting to see real world data. You know, what are the implications to ED utilization? What are the implications to inpatient stays and, and other types of um, factors? that have cost implications. And, you know, what the FDA wants to see often in, in, in making their decisions, th those data often are distinct from what the payers want to see. And so there are some uh, groups doing that real world data evaluation, but I think there's a striking need for, for more of that once these things are in the wild and we can really see the impact. Um, and then one final thing, you know, we're talking a lot about the U.S., but um, it's been interesting. We work in some other countries and uh, one example is a project we've done in Latin America where we've taken a suite of integrated digital health tools um, to increase capacity for mental health care across the whole country of Colombia, for example, right? This is a country that's been heavily impacted by, you know, generations of armed conflict and, and you know, everyone you talk to has been touched by trauma and high levels of depression and high levels of alcohol use with domestic violence. But then the mental health workforce is, you know, in Bogota or, you know, confined to urban settings. So you have this whole population level mental health need and, you 
you have a very limited clinical capacity to meet that need and how do you solve that problem? And so working with that country, for example, you know, they wanted to have a population level solution. So they have sort of a different definition of value. They wanted to have a, a sort of a, a national mental health agenda. And to do that, you know, they recognize the value of how can we sort of supercharge and extend the clinician workforce we have with a digital health solution that transforms healthcare delivery models. And we were able to do that in the with partnership with the primary care system around the country, which historically had never ever touched the topic of mental health. It was just confined to especially psychiatric hospitals, but even depression or other common mental health disorders were not addressed in primary care. So value for them, yes, they wanted to see, you know, activity-based costing data that we captured in the clinical workflow and um, clinical outcomes of patients. But what they really wanted to do is think about a population level solution. So it was just interesting to think about. They're different. There are a lot of, this complicated topic, but they're, you know, lots of different perspectives, I think, on how we, uh, different folks are thinking about value. That's great, Lisa. One, one follow-up. You mentioned the extending the clinical workforce, the, or the ability of uh, digital tools to do that. Are digital tools better at expanding into the non-MD workforce? Because that's another big constraint on access, right? That there's uh, a very limited number of MDs in the U.S., so moving towards a more NP or PA or other clinical non-MD types. So uh, if I understand your question correctly, I, you know, in, in the work that we've done, research and sort of just clinical demonstration projects, these types of tools can be embedded in all kinds of, you know, partnerships with or without MDs, all kinds of healthcare professionals, mental health professionals. You know, we were talking so much about the healthcare system, but I think there's tremendous value as well for um, solutions, digital health, behavioral health solutions that that can be offered within and outside of healthcare systems as well, um, that we don't wed, you know, we don't restrict access to something you have to get a prescription for, for example. Um, I think that that really limits access. So I think that there's a real need to think flexibly about different models of deployment. Thanks. Uh, Adam? Totally, totally agree with what, what Lisa said. And your question is a great example, right? For as long as we, we're spending 12 years to try train a psychiatrist and then putting that psychiatrist out into the workforce for them to do outpatient SSRIs and SNRIs for people with depression and anxiety. I think, you know, it, we're going to continue to have these supply side issues. And the, the problem is exacerbated because on the research side, we have a lot of literature showing that MDs don't do, don't get better results for, for uh, outpatient psychotherapy or for outpatient, you know, uh, routine common mental health conditions like depression or like anxiety. And so, you know, it's, it's yet another example of how we're mismanaged, chronically mismanaging the supply side of the problem. Right. For whether it's mislicensing, whether it's, you know, providers, you know, treating uh, largely inappropriate caseloads based on the amount of time that we spent training them and the amount of money that we spent training them uh, for problems that could be handled actually better, not just not just could be handled at a lower level of licensure, but could be handled better at a lower level of licensure. Sorry, one more follow up. This. I think that's an important, important point, Adam. Can, can you describe the, the difficulties or non-difficulties with licensure across state lines and how that plays into it when it comes to digital therapeutics? Or uh, anyway, well, I, I, Adam, you have your hand raised, so I'm looking at you, but I, oh, no, it's I'll just, open uh, that up to it's, anybody. It's, <laughs> yeah, um, maybe Lisa can answer about the digital side. I can answer on the non-digital side. I would say that varies tremendously state by state. I think that um, the state by state differences are, are uh, a relic of the past, and I, I don't know how, how much longer they will continue to stay in. Look, when you zoom in on New York, it's a great example. Someone lives in Hoboken, and they work in Manhattan, and it's a 15-minute subway ride between the two. And now we're talking about provider licensure of whether they're at home or whether they're at work and saying that they can or can't treat people on either side of the border. It's it's really ridiculous, right? And and it's, um, you know, it's it's yet another artifact of, of the way that we've restricted licensure because it increases prices, right? If if you add additional licensure barriers that, that make it harder for people to get MDs or that constrain supply, it will increase prices. And I think that it's, it's not gonna be tenable Post COVID, it's become even more ridiculous when people are allowed to work across across state lines. People are allowed to, you know, buy groceries across state lines. You can do all of these other things, but then as soon as it's a provider delivering, you know, outpatient talk therapy, we we say that it's no longer allowed. I, I think that's ridiculous. I think that maybe the way that, that we get into it is through things like these interstate interstate licensure compacts. Right, at least last time I checked, twenty six states had a shared licensure agreement um, that really helps expand license uh, expand access to outpatient. Um, you know, virtual services it, tremendously for, for people if you're in New Mexico and if you're in the Dakotas, if you're in Kentucky, I think all of these places, are, um, it's pretty, pretty difficult to find local mental health access. And so these, these interstate licensure compacts are, are really helping. And I think, I think, and I hope that, you know, 10 years from now, we're not still, we're not still doing this. 
and Lisa maybe can add about the digital side. Yeah, just briefly, I I think that was a great response, Adam, and and I agree with with everything you said. So in terms of the digital therapeutic side, so let's say you get an FDA authorized digital therapeutic, it can be prescribed in any state. Um, that doesn't mean it can be paid for in any state. So for example, in Medicaid, um, you know, maybe there's eleven states now, maybe twelve that are you know reimbursing in different ways for um, for these. Um, and Medicare, there's some pending legislation around that, but. So access isn't always there, but the state line issue is less of an issue with those types of digital health tools. Steve, I see you unmuted. Oh, I um, <laughs> just listening to this, uh, Adam, your your uh, righteous ferocity at the at the current state of affairs is contagious, and uh, there are still a number of doctors and clinicians that receive faxes. You know, there's something about these industries that have set up the, you know, set up a long, long time ago um, with the with the purpose of um, helping to support their industry, not to support the consumer. And and those things uh, have legacy chains that that hold back progress. And that's why innovators are able to come up and do things differently. And then there's a time to reconcile. So yeah, I, I'm bullish, but agree. We really need to do away with that colloquialism that continues to just hurt people within states because the few want to hold on to control. I, thanks so much, Steve. So for our fourth or fifth topic, I want to turn to kind of future casting uh, and thinking about what should be on our mind for the next year and the next five years. And when we think about what people care about for the future, it's going to be different groups are going to care about different things. So I'd ask you to think about what should clinicians have on their mind? What should policymakers have on their mind? What should employers have on their mind? Because I imagine they might be slightly different. So uh, I'll open it up to anybody who wants to, to start with this uh, looking into the future question. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take a crack at uh, the, the way you laid that out. Um, I hope that clinicians have on their minds that they are service providers who want to be excellent, just like any service provider, because we have increasingly borderless uh, technologies and, and ways of delivering every kind of service and product. And that, and when I say borders, it's not just across countries and states, it's also across domains. You know, I can get, I can get services and goods in so many ways at my fingertips, and those um, providers of those things that are that are that entail the least friction and have the best service are the ones I will keep using. And I hope that our providers uh, increasingly move toward that model. And and that that's a different level of consumer empathy than than learning to listen to a to a patient. So I'm hopeful for that. Um, I, I'm hopeful that that uh, that we we end up with a blended model <clears throat> where no matter what door you walk in, you can get great care for the consumer. So whether I look at an app on my phone or whether I go into a building or whether I make a phone call or whether I go to the doctor I always go to um, and they've got a collaborative care arrangement that I can always get routed into getting some kind of mental health support. And when it gets more and more acute, that there's an answer. That's a harder question. Um, the, the hot, the, when you have greater acuity and, and, and um, more narrowly defined needs, it gets harder and harder. I don't, I'm not sure how much we'll tackle that in five years, but I hope we can at least tackle some more of the addiction stuff that's happening. So, so those are more hopes, maybe in predictions. And, you know, for, in terms of maybe a, a prediction, um, I mean, I, I would like to see and hope that we see, and maybe, I don't know if I can predict it, but that, um, you know, access to care will, will be an issue that we no longer face for the vast majority of the population uh, true access to care, regardless of age, regardless of funding mechanism, in the next five years. I think that'd be a great goal. I don't know if I can predict it'll happen though. Lisa or uh, yeah. Anna? Lisa? Sure. Yeah. I well, first of all, I think Steve's points are excellent, and I won't repeat them. I'll just underscore the importance of them. So I think a um, couple of thoughts in terms of what clinicians would have on their mind. So what's interesting is that you know, again, I've been doing this for a long time. In the early days, we saw you know 
sort of perceived threat by clinicians. Like, is technology going to take away my job? And, you know, I'm especially trained for this. And, you know, I don't want to touch this because it, it's going to threaten my, my, my career path. But we've seen a big transformation in that already, where I think there's a lot of excitement in, the, in many clinician communities about the potential to have additional tools in their toolbox to extend the reach and the impact of what they can do. And, and I think that um, that's been a really exciting um, trend to see. Um, you know, I think we we can't talk about the future needs without talking about payment. And I know it costs us and everything, but the payment issues are still really problematic for a lot of these. And, and Adam was highlighting the underpayment we see in this space in the behavioral health space. It's a really, really significant issue. And you know, some people are working on it, but we really need an accelerated focus on the importance of this. But you know, I think when we just think about the future, if we think about technology, right, it's already transformed so much of our society and how we live our daily lives from education to finance to retail, to social communications. I mean, it's, it's been so impactful in so much of our lives, and yet we really haven't redefined healthcare with technology in the way that we can really leverage technology to do, to have this, you know, scalable uh, sort of way to give people effective solutions all over the globe. And I think as part of that, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I think it's a really interesting time with all of those confluence of factors that really position us well for a new future. And I think a key part of that is really engaging all the relevant stakeholders in, in, in sort of thinking together about how to have the most efficient and, and impactful way to move this forward. You know, I come from a scientific community. You know, we need to be working with clinicians and payers and industry and policy folks and people in regulatory space together, not just to bring the best practices to scale, but to understand understand, you know, what are the meaningful scientific questions we should be asking? What are the data people want to see that they need to really scale these things? So I think that there's a tremendous opportunity for that interdisciplinary dialogue and um, partnership to really redefine healthcare with technology. And I do think that one day we're not going to be talking about digital health as its own thing. I think eventually it's going to be so woven into the fabric of health and healthcare. It's just going to be part of what we do in, in health and healthcare. And I don't think it'll have its own naming way as it does now. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Uh, Adam. Totally, totally agree with everything that Lisa said. The, um, it, it, I, I, I keep in my head like echoing uh, what Steve said at the beginning about this, you know, this, this, in, um, this reluctance or inertia that we had around in-person care. And that's just such a great example, right? Like the pandemic hit, we had this opportunity uh, to, to try and change the way that we do things. And we put therapy on video and everyone was like, okay, well, you know, we can at least carry on doing therapy. And then we looked at the outcomes and okay, that's slightly better because adherence is better and, and clinical outcomes are basically the same. So, you know, it, it's not an it's not an efficacy issue. But when we look at that that instance, right, there is a tremendous opportunity to use technology to make it better. In this case, like we basically just took technology, put it in there. We were like, okay, let's take traditional therapy, let's put put it on video, we're good to go. Like that is a use of technology, but it's a relatively superficial use of technology, right? We could really invest in what would it look like to make video therapy better than in-person therapy, right? When you watch football, uh, you know, on Monday night, you see playbacks, you see snippets, you see analysis, you can go back and see what people did in, in previous in previous games, and you can understand tactics, and you can really start to put a lot of use technology to bring a lot of structure to the process of what's going on and, and really enhance the experience of, of watching these games and learning and, and engaging in it, right? I think that the same opportunity exists that we have in therapy, where we could be recording sessions, we could have playbacks, you could, you know, when you're having a, a you know, relationship issues, go back to what your therapist told you last time and, and re-listen to what they said and, and rehearse that and, and kind of go back in and take those those skills and techniques into your life and, and and really enrich the time between those sessions. That would, for me, that that's a use case where technology could make therapy much better than it was in person, right? I think that, you know, the pandemic is tricky because it's a fire of problems that we've been drinking from. But I think that in general, the use of technology in mental health care is still relatively superficial. In digital CBT, we take the, you know, the workbooks and the manuals and we put them into an app. You know, in, in therapy, we put the the face-to-face -face interaction on a video. I think that we're still in extremely early days for how we can use technology to make mental health care, um, you know, really different and, and I hope really better. Thanks so much. Um, we still have a couple minutes left, so folks, please put uh, additional questions in the chat. We have some uh, great ones already. Beth, do you want to take one of these to the, the panelists? Yeah, sure. So one of the questions from the audience is around how we might think about bringing alignment to what are currently very 
different perceptions of value of uh, behavioral health, uh, digital behavioral health from the perspective of consumers versus providers versus payers. And specifically this idea that, you know, consumers really might place a lot of value on these types of technologies in part due to convenience and opportunity costs, whereas providers might primarily be thinking about return on investment in terms of revenue and clinical effectiveness. Payers, as has come up several times, are often uh, still thinking um, in terms of cost reduction, right? So misalignment of, of values. How uh, might we bring that misalignment into alignment? I'll just open that up for anybody who wants to take it. All right, I'll, I'll go first. Um, it's quite a complicated question, just, just like the, the length of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm looking for the for the misalignment. Um, I think there's lots of individual issues there. Ultimately, in in our world, which is you know employer sponsored benefit world, um, all of the vendors that are relatively strong show net promoter scores, NPS scores that are quite positive, or customer satisfaction scores are quite positive. So that's a way to bring in that level of um, scheduling flexibility and convenience opportunity costs that were mentioned is in the first part of that question. So I think that gets baked in and those best solutions are the ones that end up being in network or reimbursed somehow by the health plan. So I think those things are somewhat aligned already. You know, the best solutions actually end up rising to the top. Um, but I think there's a larger question in here about Pricing, well, that doesn't change pricing because there's still only a certain amount that they're going to be willing to pay. You know, a better solution maybe can charge a little more, but not a lot more. Um, but I, so I, I don't, I don't see that issue as much from from our world. Um, but but improvements in patient experience are actually why these solutions have taken over. I mean, why, why did why did EAPs get clobbered, deservedly or not, um, by these new solutions because there was a bad patient experience. People couldn't get access, like hard stop. So I feel like I feel positive about the progress that's been made there. Um, and ultimately, people are going to use the solution that they think works for them. They're not going to use those that don't. So ultimately, those should. I, I'm I'm capitalist enough to believe that those things should rise to the top, whether the consumers pay themselves or the plan sponsors pay for it. But it's more direct when the consumers pay themselves. Yeah, I would say the. Um... There is no like one solution, right? It's not like this one magical thing that we can twist and now all of the incentives are realigned. I think we can pull apart some of the issues that were described, right? So one of them was around provider reimbursement. Yes, providers want to get paid more. Obviously, that's their job, right? They they do work and they want to get paid more just like everyone else does, right? And um, I think I can give an example that we have at Spring. So uh, at Spring Health, all of the providers that work for us use all of our systems that allows us to do um, you know, pretty in-depth performance measurement and performance tracking, whether it's in terms of patient satisfaction, whether it's in terms of remission rates or readmission rates, whether it's in terms of, you know, continuity of care or the duration of care, whether it's the therapeutic alliance that they can deliver. So there is pretty core evidence-based metrics on which we can evaluate providers. And so we have a pretty good sense of which providers do better and which ones do worse. Uh, and we actually pay them based on that. So if people do better, they get bonuses. And if people do worse, you know, they'll get less patient volume and they'll also make less on a fee-for-service basis. And then on the employer side, the people who are paying us for the care, we also go quite significantly at risk. A large portion of those contracts are at risk for things like um, clinical outcomes, for things like NPS that, or provider satisfaction or therapeutic alliance, like Steve mentioned. And so ultimately, that's an example of where you can realign incentives a little bit, at least around that piece of the puzzle where employers will will pay me more or less depending on my clinical outcomes and my member satisfaction. And they're willing to because they, they see what those differences are. And in some cases, some cases even pay us more depending on total cost of care reduction. Uh, and then on the other side, when I go and look at the, the supply side, you know, I pay providers more if, if they perform better on these KPIs and, and I'm happy to pay them more because, you know, I get paid more for delivering those results. And so there are ways that you can do it. Um, look, it's not easy, right? If you look at, if you ask why don't health plans do it or why haven't they done it? Again, you get back into the tactics of, okay, well, how is healthcare delivered? Most of those health plans are actually just provider registries. They don't really know what care is being delivered. They don't know anything about the quality. They don't know anything about the notes. They don't know anything about the schedules. They don't know anything apart from maybe what claims, what the agreed rate is and, and 
you know, what the timeliness of, of re repaying those claims are. So again, you know, there, I think there are examples of where we can pull apart specific pieces of misalignment and try and get those more aligned. But, um, but even those, I think there are still structural or imp uh, issues relating to the infrastructure of care delivery uh, that might preclude incumbents from, from changing those things. Lisa, do you want to close this out? Yeah, here? just really quickly to comment on that, you know, as we talk about sort of the, the issue of alignment of these things in the healthcare system, I just want to underscore again what came up earlier about the importance of having access to these types of resources in not only within but outside of the healthcare system. We can have accessible sort of models and you know outside of traditional models of care. And I think that's really important. And one thing that we've seen in some of our work is that, you know, in addition to the benefits that that the that we see in, in the QA here about from consumers' perspective of these digital digital health tools, we've also seen, you know, that particularly around stigma and access that people might want to go use a digital sort of tool and resource instead of going to our traditional models of care. And we've seen in some cases when people do that, and that's the first time that they seek any behavioral health care, that sometimes that's a conduit to treatment entry for them for the first time, because they're interested, you know, they're contacting something that has therapeutic value to them and then can engage in additional higher level of care. So I think we need to also recognize that these things can intersect in, in lots of different ways. So thanks. Thank you so much. And uh, on behalf of uh, Beth and I, I want a tremendous thanks to our three panelists for this engaging, exciting, and interesting um, discussion. I also want to thank everyone in the audience for spending an hour with us and also call your attention to what Charmista put in the chat, which this is a, a year-long webinar series. Our next webinar is uh, January 30th. Um, and it is on the evolving role of CMOs in modern organizations, and you can click that link um, to register. So thank you again to our panelists. Thank you to HBHI and the Center for Mental Health and Addiction Policy for sponsoring us today. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having us.